My name is Katriona Power. I'm the Director of Partnerships and Strategy at Foresight Clean Technology Accelerator. Today we are here to run our Future Economy series with a focus on the mining sector. We are going to present to you some great content and we also have a great lineup of panelists who will discuss the recommendations that we came up in our that we came up with in our recent report. Our agenda for today, we will do a round of introductions with our panelists. We will then move on to a short presentation from the core clean tech cluster with a focus on the mining sector. We will then move on to a moderated panel discussion and then we'll make some time 10 to 15 minutes for Q&A and closing remarks. If you have any questions at any time, please do put them into the chat box and the Q&A box and our moderator will be looking for those. So without further ado, I'm going to pass it over to our guest speakers to introduce themselves. We'll start with Michelle Serres, then Peter Wan, Chi Ting, and our moderator, David Sanguinetti. Michelle? Yes, many thanks, Katiana. Uh, um, I'm Michelle, I'm part of ABB. Uh, we are specialized in electrification components, uh, and uh, we have uh, a division for mining. I'm sitting in Montreal as we speak, and I'm responsible for the North American market in terms of innovation and, and digital. And when I'm saying innovation is something that we never did before, and, and what we are trying to implement is uh, clean tech technology across mining applications. Peter? And I'm Peter One from Tech Resources, so I work in our uh, technology and innovation group here, leading our efforts in the low carbon economy. So. Uh, all of our portfolio related to greenhouse gas emission reduction. Uh, we have four primary emission sources, being mobile equipment, electricity, stationary combustion, and process and fugitive emissions. And our short-term focus is around uh, mobile equipment and clean electricity. Chi Ting. Hi, everyone. My name is Chi Ting Luo. I'm with ELO Solutions. I'm a consultant working with the mining industry on innovation strategy development and implementation. We also have uh, technical experts on um, carbon and energy systems. So today, I think I, I just want to mention briefly that one of the work that we recently completed um, is to help be the province of BC to develop a mining innovation roadmap. I will not speak about all the details about this roadmap, but I think it might come um, to have lots of collaborative uh, opportunities with what we're discussing today. And I'm David Sanguinetti. I'm an executive in residence here with Foresight. Uh, I also have a little bit of a background uh, in uh, mining. I'm most recently working with the Global Mining Guidelines Group on their uh, guideline for battery electric vehicles and underground mining. So a little bit of uh, passing knowledge on the subject, though not as much as uh, uh, Chi Ting, Michelle, or, or Peter. Thank you, everyone. We really look forward to hearing from you later. So before we begin, we'll, before we begin the panel session, we'll do a quick presentation for seven minutes just to discuss the research that we've been looking at in, this, in the sector and also what mining roadmaps exist to support climate action. So the Core Clean Tech Cluster is a new initiative that was launched last week. Our goal is to support a clean economy and position BC as a global centre for innovation, talent and capital to scale clean technology. We are doing this across many sectors and we're working with many collaborators in the ecosystem, be that industry, SMEs, academia, investors and government. And what we do is we facilitate engagement, we identify gaps and we bring people together to collaborate on projects and initiatives. The goals of the cluster are to strengthen local and global partnerships to accelerate activities for a clean economy, to showcase BC as a place to invest in clean tech companies and projects, to facilitate and engage stakeholders for impactful collaborative clean tech projects in BC, to foster talent and skills for clean tech commercialization and scale up, as we know that is a huge uh, challenge in the sector. And lastly, but not least, to promote opportunities and programs to increase international exports of clean technology expertise and know-how. The sectors that the core clean tech cluster will focus on are the built environment, natural resources, including mining and forestry, 
agriculture and food, energy, transportation and water. So why are we here today? What we've been doing at Foresight and the Core Clean Tech Cluster, we have been reviewing the roadmaps that exist across sectors to support the meeting of climate targets by 2030 to 2050. And so we've been developing these snapshots, um, three to five page publications that you can find on the Core Clean Tech website for all these sectors and our research. And what we have found is a various different approaches and guidance and codes and standards for different industries to meet their climate action targets. But there is also gaps and that's really important for us to talk about and we'll talk about that a bit more today. So we're focused on the mining sector for a number of reasons. Firstly, it is a very carbon intensive sector and its primary mineral and metal production is responsible for 10% of global carbon emissions. But also it's integral, the sector is integral to how we're going to achieve lowering emissions because if we need to use those minerals and metals to support clean technology development like new batteries and things like that. So we need to develop an approach where for the mining sector um, in collaboration with others to support this. There's a number of advantages that we have in British Columbia. We are a known mining hub with you know, various talent and expertise in the sectors. We have very strong linkages with academia for research and development purposes, such as UBC. We have known advantages in ore sorting. We're very competitive at that, which helps to create better efficiencies and material recovery in the, in the mining development and exploration. We're also very advantageous in terms of water and wastewater technologies, and they're commonly deployed on sites to recover um, water. Um, to recover water. So there's a huge um, array of expertise that we have in the province regarding this area. When we look at the existing guidance and roadmaps that exist for mining companies, we learn that it's not, uh, mining companies are adopting their own internal roadmaps, but they're also looking at uh, the International Council for Mining um, and their roadmaps. They're also looking at CMIC, the Canadian Mining Innovation Council and what guidance they're providing, as well as the UN SDGs. And our interviews with industry and our research showed us that the approach to roadmaps can be is more so company specific than across industry. And mining is an international industry and that's very well known. So developing something that's global and that you know, meets market requirements is quite integral to an approach, which explains that the internal approaches are most common. And so these are the typical guidance that exists today. As for the technologies that these companies, industry companies are looking at, and these are all mining companies that we interviewed, they're looking at various different things, um, which is either ensuring a clean energy supply, or they're looking at electrification of operations. And they're looking at these two, two areas to help meet their climate action targets, or to meet regulatory guidance um, as issued by local governments, such as Clean BC and other types of regulations that exist. Things that the companies highlighted as very important were transmission lines to be able to source renewable energy to locations, uh, off-grid locations from mining sites, um, building power generation and storage on site, also electrification, how to retrofit a mine for um, electrification and for how to retrofit a mine for electrification, vehicles and equipment, you know, moving to electrical equipment, and also deploying energy efficiency as well. So the number of different technologies are being explored. However, there's also a number of barriers. It is quite costly to get electricity to remote areas, and it's difficult economically to retrofit existing equipment as well. We also found the ROI um, on for the investment for the life cycle of the equipment compared with the mine as well um, needs to match up. So in terms of our research and what we found, there is 
there isn't a global um, group or an initiative where bringing everybody together to work on an industry roadmap together around climate action for 2030, 2050. Um, so we recommend that would be something that's also looked at. But other recommendations came to light as well, such as funding partnerships to de-risk electricity projects, um, and be that with the industry, government partner, partners, and also communities who are in those areas. So there is some sort of um, uh, partnership where there is opportunity to utilize that electricity once the mine is closed. Last, secondly, there's a great opportunity to become a, for BC to become a global hub for electrification expertise. We're already very good at water, wastewater or sorting. There's no reason why we can't build that electrification expertise in BC and use that as an export opportunity. Thirdly, to increase research, development and deployment funding for further ore sorting technologies and increase those efficiencies. Next, there's a great opportunity to, to increase knowledge sharing between parallel initiatives. In our interviews, for example, with the transportation sector, they're actually looking to understand how the mining sector is electrifying and what, what makes sense in terms of costs and how to do it. And there's a great opportunity for parallel learning between, across industries. Also, another recommendation to be able to help move the needle for electrification would be funding and incentives for non-fossil heavy duty trucks and the not to, help, so to support emissions reductions from transportation on sites. And lastly, but not least, to leverage the mining innovation roadmap to drive adoption of technologies that will advance clean BC's industry targets. And these are the recommendations that we're coming out with. There is more detail in the report that's on the Core Clean Tech website. Please have a look there. We're now going to pass it over to David and the panelists who will discuss these recommendations. Thank you. Actually, if you can go back to the recommendations slide. Thank you. So yes, uh, we've got a, a series of recommendations here. And as a, a first pass, if we could run around uh, the group, uh, and I'll call you out just in the order that you happen to be uh, stacked up on my screen here. Um, but if you could at least each uh, comment on um, your thoughts on these recommendations, which ones really resonate with you, uh, and uh, uh, which you think are perhaps the highest priority. So starting cheating is uh, top of my list on my screen right now. So if you could uh, kick that off, please. Sure. Well, first of all, um, Katriona mentioned that it would be nice to have a global hub on some sort of climate change um, group. So the global mining standard, which is an international group, is actually looking into establishing a climate action working group. And that would be uh, one of the international consortium that's looking into how can we all work together on this topic. It's not yet set up, but it's something to perhaps to keep an eye on as, as you uh, move forward on, on your recommendations. Um, so on the list here, which I like, I think they're all great recommendations. I think something that really will help the mining industry tremendously is that increased knowledge sharing between um, parallel initiatives that's probably outside of the mining sector with the mining sector. So some, some of us may say that even within the mining sector, we need to do better in terms of collaborating um, and understanding what's happening in other places in mining, but certainly being able to borrow and learn from what's happening outside of mining is something that I think is going to be critical for us to get on that path of decarbonization. Um, certainly, I, as I briefly mentioned, the government uh, and the industry are working on this mining innovation roadmap that we're supporting, and certainly we would love to have another opportunity to walk you through that in a bit more detail. What I can tell you is that uh, leveraging BC's sustainability advantage is one of the primary goals in this roadmap, so certainly a lot of opportunities to discuss further on these other recommendations. And lastly, not really uh, something to maybe consider is, is this point on becoming a global hub for electrification expertise. Um, I work with quite a few mining companies uh, globally and in Ontario, they've actually really gone ahead and did uh, tremendously on the electrification of the mining space, mostly underground. Um, but I think it's something, you know, we can, we can look into learning and, and sharing from other jurisdictions to really 
um, leverage what maybe additional expertise that we can bring in instead of trying to repeat that and set up something that may already be on the way. Excellent, thank you. Uh, Michelle. Yes, um, I would say that all the, 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 the six points in terms of recommendation are quite relevant to market. Um, let me pick two. Um, then, the, the, you know, I have been starting to work on mine electrification, I think, in 2015. And that has mainly been driven by the Ontario projects and uh, mainly driven by underground operation. When I'm looking what is happening in BC over the last, let's say, 18 months, uh, it's much more surface operation. And I think it's a big chance for BC to, um, I would say, uh, through some funding and incentive, um, to build a, a hub and, and to, to release the, 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 I would say, the fear for mining industry to be the first. And uh, I mean, to have this EV duty track Uh, funded by the, the, the or partially funded by the, the, the BC government would be a fantastic achievement. However, I mean, clearly, one of the, the things that mining is facing years after years is um, I don't know personally one mine so is close by city center. Yeah. Then uh, the remote location of the mining the mining site is is a big challenge in terms of uh, um, electricity and, and energy distribution. And uh, I mean, clearly, um, to I mean, if we want to de-risk projects and investment in mining and to, to swap to the electrification projects, uh, we would need some support uh, from BC to ensure that we'll have enough power at the right location, either in terms of, uh, I would say, line distribution, either in terms of clean power generation and energy storage. But, I mean, both are certainly one of the, uh, I mean, between the pilot of an EV duty tracks and, uh, and the industrial scale of electrical mines, I would say I will bet on the first one. I mean, the first bullet is certainly one of the critical bottlenecks to make it happen. Excellent. Thank you. David, can I, can I just add that there actually is a surface mine in Quebec, a graphic mine that has been designed for um, electric, 100% electric mine. Um, yes. So again, we can look into that as an opportunity um, as we Move on. If I'm mistaken, Michelle worked on that one. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure he does. Just, just a bit. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and actually, looking at the uh, attendee list, I see one or two folks uh, on the attendee list, I think, who are involved in that one as well. But yeah, anyway, I see that's, that. so move, moving on to Peter. Yeah, thanks, David. Um, I think that this is a, a great list of recommendations. Um, it, I think it's important to note, too, as Katriana showed in a previous slide that mining is truly a global business. And so, you know, you see International Council of Mining Metals, you see Canadian Mining Innovation Council. These are really important uh, tiers that we need to work with at a, at a higher level and strategic level. And then we get into the more regional partnerships where we, we need to be thinking not just strategically, but tactically, how is this going to hit the ground running? Uh, and how, how are we going to make it happen? And so the partnerships that are really critical for us in this sphere, uh, working with government, working with utilities, working with uh, you know, funding agencies and, and suppliers all together to work out how, how the wheels actually spin when we're on the ground. So that's a really critical piece for us and, and it's important that we, that we nurture that through things like the Cork Clean Tech Cluster. Some of those uh, areas that we look at as well, um, while they're, they're global in nature like renewable energy, there's a real local element to them as well. And the environmental conditions in, in BC, as an example, uh, you're going to get very different um, outputs from, from solar or wind than you would, say, in Chile or in Australia. And so having that localised expertise and experience is going to play a critical part in, in how we move forward with those sorts of technologies as well. So, um, again, a great list. I think it's really important that we have uh, expertise in our local area, uh, even in these COVID times, having expertise close at hand where we know we can reach out quite easily. Uh, they can visit us when, when that's possible again. Uh, these are all critical elements for, for us making sure that we hit the ground running. Excellent. So. 
um, speaking now to our attendees, uh, there is a Q&A uh, box uh, at the bottom of your screen. If you have questions, uh, please feel free to pop them in there. We're not going to deal with them right away. Uh, so I've got a couple more questions for the panels as, as part of their discussion, but uh, we will do our best to get to, uh, get to those. Um, so we can, uh, uh, if you have those questions, please uh, pop them into that uh, Q&A box there. So, um, Peter, you actually brought up uh, an interesting point there about who needs to be involved in one of these these exercises like the Core Clean Tech Cluster. Um, and you mentioned particularly government and utilities. Uh, that that brings to mind an interesting you know, aspect of the cluster is that it brings people together. Could you highlight, and then I'd also like uh, Michelle and Chi Ting to discuss this, uh, who all do you think really needs to be involved? Is it uh, provincial government, federal government? How, what, which sectors? Uh, who, what are the different actors who need to get involved in, in something like this? Well, we definitely need involvement at both the federal and provincial levels um, and key players within the province as well and across industry. So uh, the example that I'll cite is that um, Catriona referenced that it can be challenging getting power into remote sites, but the same applies for our grid connected sites. A lot of our, in fact, all of our BC grid connected sites, we can see that we're coming up against transmission constraints in the coming years. And we do need to make sure that, that we have the capacity to enable electrification projects. If, if we were to look at our, our truck fleet alone, our, our whole truck fleet in, in BC, uh, and electrify that whole fleet, that would more than double and possibly triple our, electric, our electricity demand at our sites. And so, you know, that, that's a big ask. And there's, a, there's funding, there's um, permitting, uh, the timelines for permitting is, is a critical piece. And there's how we manage uh, the load demand and infrastructure. And Michelle can talk a lot more uh, detail on that than I can. But uh, we need all of those players at the table and, and it's going to be not just mining, but all of the other sectors that have been referenced uh, as well, because we're all going to be jockeying for that same sort of cap capacity. So uh, yeah, we, we need a, we need a, a wholehearted discussion with all those parties. So Michelle, uh, from your perspective, who do we need to be uh, bringing in? You're, you're on mute. Thanks, uh, Dave. Um, no, I mean, definitely both. I mean, the provincial and, and, and the federal are, are needed. I mean, if you are looking about the hub or the cluster principle, um, you, you can look at Canada in, in terms of different type of assets. And I would position BC as an ideal asset for open pit or surface operation um, as, as a potential pilot across Canada. Then, I mean, definitely we need both. And on top of that, um, I would say this knowledge sharing that we, we, we talked about before, I think we can learn a lot from each other, from the different province uh, in terms of uh, past investment or, or today investment in, in this conversion of, uh, of diesel fleet to electrical fleet. I mean, it is, it is it's a huge potential, um, I would say, accelerator uh, to make that transformation happen. Excellent. And Chi Ting, with your involvement on the uh, roadmap for innovation generally in mining, uh, you've got some uh, experience in bringing people together. Uh, what would you say uh, is uh, sort of the key recipe for, for getting people together uh, for something like this cluster in order to actually achieve results? Yeah, I, I guess uh, what Peter and Michelle have talked about are maybe a way to look at the traditional mining methods or looking into converting uh, existing mines to take up electrification or decarbonize. Um, if you look at it from a different perspective on developing and designing new mines, then I think other actors that you may want to bring in are the technology companies 
so that they can, perhaps there are different ways of hauling rocks in the future. And maybe there are different ways, you know, we talked about ore sorting in this, in this set of recommendations, but there are many different uh, technologies that might be coming or may be able to be developed um, as we move forward in this low carbon future. So I think it really is, uh, is um, all kinds of actors can be part of this uh, cluster, but be depending on the problem we're trying to solve, a different subsets of these actors should come together to solve these problems. Excellent, thank you. So how about we touch on one of the uh, questions that we, we have in the chat box here, or Q&A box. So um, Peter, could, there's a question here. UBC researchers have been looking for years at the potential to use mine tailings for carbon sequestration. Uh, is this still too much of a research project to be incorporated in the current slate of recommendations? Any thoughts how, on how viable this option is? So. Yeah, look, it's, it's a really interesting um, opportunity. And uh, at the moment, it is still in the research phase, but it has been actively explored by companies. I know that, uh, that De Beers are working with UBC. Um, there's, there's operations elsewhere in Australia and beyond. We're actually looking at this as well. Um, one of the key things for this is that the geochemistry of, of the materials has to be right. It has to be the type of material that's going to be able to take up that carbon. Uh, and so the preliminary research that we're doing is, is lab scale test work of the materials of the waste rock um, and even looking at what the tailings options might be at, at other properties within BC um, and to see whether they do have good um, abatement opportunities. Interesting space. Yeah, cool. It's, it's good to hear that it's, it's at least got the potential. If I can add to that quickly, so there is a mining, junior mining company in BC called Giga Metals, and they're a cobalt producer, and they are also part of the consortium that Tech has mentioned that, that is um, looking into using carbon sequestration uh, for their tailings. And so that's, uh, so there's a company that's actively looking to that. As, as Peter has mentioned, the tech, technology readiness level of this technology is maybe not yet in that um, piloting stage. Exploration phases as well, uh, and looking at uh, some of the, the deep learning or, or analytical approaches to even designing um, uh, exploration patterns and, and, uh, and grids. So, so it's definitely a, a very, hot area at the moment. It's an area that we are focused on and I think we're going to see a lot of really exciting developments in that space in the, in the next few years. Perfect. So I want to step back then. Uh, actually, one, one other question we have here that we, uh, Peter, you've uh, highlighted you wanted to speak to. Um, there's a question on the view of hydrogen in comparison to electric. And that, I mean, this is a question that uh, is, comes up when you're talking about road transport. It's, uh, I've heard it discussed for uh, ocean going freight uh, as well. It's um, a hot debate uh, uh, all across the clean tech space. So uh, interested to hear, um, actually all three of you to hear what, you, what your uh, take is on hydrogen versus uh, electric. Yeah, I'll jump in so that the others can then contradict and uh, dispute everything that I say rather than the other way around. Um, we think hydrogen is a really interesting uh, technology. We think that there's a, there's a lot of opportunity and, and getting, our, getting a handle and an understanding of exactly what the best uses for it are, what the killer app is, as it were, um, is, is where we're sort of focusing our efforts at the moment. And first and foremost in that is really around the cost of production of hydrogen itself. So you know, for us, as we move towards uh, our, our targets of carbon neutral mining, um, it's really critical that that hydrogen is pr produced carbon free. Uh, and if you look at global production of hydrogen, to hydrogen today, less than 1% of it is, is truly carbon free. So uh, that's the first challenge. Uh, and then the second challenge of that is it's, it's one thing to produce it carbon free. Can you produce it at a, at a reasonable cost? Uh, and, and our research or our, our information at this stage suggests that the cost of, of green hydrogen in BC today is, is over three times the cost of uh, carbon produced through steam methane reforming. So at the moment, you know, it, it becomes a little bit 
not viable. But having said that, we want to get in and the, into the space early and start learning what those uses are. And so we're looking at, at various options about how can we produce our own green hydrogen uh, and what are the best pilots that we can apply to, to really understand uh, the, how efficient and how effective they are. Uh, and, and is that in energy storage? Is it in process uh, uses like process heat? Or is it in electromobility? Uh, so, so we'll look to start up some pilots in the, in the in the near future that help us really understand those spaces. Okay, thank you. So, uh, Michelle, what what would uh, your answer be to, on hydrogen? <laughs> Thanks today for the question. Um, <laughs> the, 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 today, I would say. If I'm looking about, um, I would say the international roadmap from different mining companies. I mean, definitely, if uh, I'm looking about the, the the service vehicles like the, the water tank or the, the service trucks, um, clearly, I mean, it's a it's a, it's, a, it's a huge uh, push for a battery equipped mobile equipment. If I'm looking today for the the haulage trucks, um, then we can talk about haulage. We can talk about some hybridization of trolley, trolley and batteries. And I know only one project where, I mean, the, the, the whole track uh, will be tested with uh, hydrogen. Um, and uh, I mean, it is, it, is, it, is, it is a long road in front of us. And I mean, I would say that if, if we want to go fast uh, and, and reasonably fast at the speed of a mining industry, um, if we want to use and leverage today technology and, and, and availability of existing solutions, then, I mean, a combination of trolley and, and battery is certainly uh, the, the most successful path. Now, I mean, as we know, uh, when we will be able to produce hydrogen at the larger scale that we are able to do today, then the price would go down and the ability to produce uh, hydrogen uh, tracks uh, will be, uh, I would say, more important. Um, then, if I'm looking about the roadmap, I would say for the next ten years, uh, I would say uh, that electri track electrification is certainly the foregoing. Thank you, Chi Ting. Do you? Uh, what have you been hearing when you're doing your roadmaps of uh, hydrogen versus uh, electrification? Yeah, I guess if you look at the physics and chemistry, the hydrogen does have higher density, energy density than batteries. So that is definitely a pro for hydrogen. So something to note is that in Australia, I think at the end of the year, uh, some of the largest mining companies have come together and set up a green hydrogen consortium. So this is specifically looking for new technologies that can source some green hydrogen, like uh, Peter was talking about, to, to decarbonize their fleet. So as Michelle was talking about right now, current today, for you to select hydrogen as a solution is probably unlikely. I also have worked with a couple projects where we consider hydrogen as a transportation fuel for larger fleet. Um, but it's not like technology today based on its cost and where the hydrogen comes from, it's not really a viable solution. But something to think about though, is when you look at into achieving this target, whether that is two degrees above, um, Current, current stage uh, or 1.5 degrees, whatever that temperature you want to maintain, temperature t increase you want to maintain, there needs to be a very significant shift on how we do business now in mining from now to the future. So some new technology that can provide that step change solution is going to really be valuable in that in that you know time horizon as we reach 2050. So I would say I would not discount hydrogen, um, but I would certainly look forward to some new development in technology and uh, cost reduction. Excellent, thank you. So now I'd like to step back to these recommendations because uh, Chi Ting, uh, you bring up a, a very important point there is you know, in order to achieve uh, the clean BC targets, the IPCC targets, we need to move very aggressively. Uh, so are these recommendations that we've put here, are they uh, aggressive enough or do we actually need to uh, be doing more with as part of core, as part of uh, the mining industry generally? Um, I'm an optimist and I'm an overachiever, so I always feel like we need to do more. 
Uh, I think these sets of recommendations are certainly excellent. And I think in your next slide, which we had like a very quick glimpse of it, you, do, you have set some targets. I think that those are the important first steps to have a target and then you, you look backwards on how do we achieve those targets based on the timelines we have. So some of the technologies that, you know, electrification certainly is a very important step towards decarbonization, especially in BC, where we have low carbon electricity. Um, but if we do want to achieve carbon neutrality, um, there will be difficult decisions that need to be made in order to actually get there. And, yeah. and you know, those are in the details of that, you know, these recommendations are addressing, but they're not, you know, we, we, we're not yet ready to talk about the specifics. Michelle. Yeah, I mean, they are certainly aggressive, but uh, the thing we will need to, 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 to agree on is to put some timeline uh, on each of the ballot to be addressed, right? Um, you know, uh, I mean, it's, it's mining industry is not a fast mover for sure. Um, it's, um, I mean, we need to provide a lot of risk mitigation and it makes fully sense because it's a continuous process. It's a remote process. And we need to ensure that at the end of the day, um, with all the, the, the leverage, and we did not talk too much about that today, but what, what, what we all agree, uh, somehow with all the clean tech technology which is coming on the next decades, uh, we will need to produce more on the mining side to have access to more different type of ore. Then we need to leverage this uh, clean tech technology to ensure that the in production or like uh, I mean we talk about graphite before we can talk about lithium we can talk about nickel or copper um, I mean all these uh, metals that we will need to 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 be uh, on the clean tech side of our planet um, we need to to develop that in a sustainable way and 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 to do that we need we need an aggressive uh, I would say um, uh, table but we need also to rely on, on very aggressive timeline because more we are waiting, more we are leveraging, um, I would say the GHG emission that we have today in the diesel um, and the diesel uh, for, the, for, the, for the overall fleet. Then my recommendation uh, on, on this recommendation would be uh, on the roadmap to have some timeline to be able to have the first early adopter um, in BC on some of key actions uh, to, to make this change happen because it's key if we want to sustain our our planet and if we want to be able to feed the clean tech technology with additional and different chill uh, type of ore. And Peter, I'll ask you as well uh, on uh, timelines. Do we need to be more aggressive? I think there is some some aggression required. Um, to to Michelle's point, we need to to set a target, draw a line in the sand, and 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 create the urgency. And, and I think the urgency needs to be around the partnerships and the funding models. So we talked earlier about the parties that we need to bring together. Uh, but, but the other key piece of it is, is the money side. You know, when we look at our processes internally, the economics, the, the project no-go, go decisions are still based around financial metrics. So, um, you know, we're not yet taking into account those ESG elements that, that we're talking about here. And so um, for us to be able to, to get it across the line, we, we need to realize that, that clean tech typically comes with a higher capital price and may have a lower operating, but in our environment, capital is king. So what can funding do to help us reduce that capital? What, what can funding do to help that barrier to entry be lowered and, and allow us to accelerate the development? Okay, thank you. So very much related to that, what we're talking about then is aggressively bringing in new technologies. Uh, so there's a question here um, that's focused on, actually, I think we've got two questions very much related. One is focused on bringing in new technologies. One is uh, talking about how startups uh, can, can get involved and as a general rule, startups are bringing in new technologies. So perhaps, Chi Ting, we can start with you on your take on bringing on how startups can get involved and uh, what's the best way of bringing in new technologies into mining? 
Yeah, I just want to maybe mention the uh, BC Mining Innovation Roadmap again. So one of the key recommendations is to develop a, um, a BC Mining Innovation Hub and in this so that it can help coordinate and facilitate some of these collaboration opportunities. So I think certainly not just us in, in terms of the innovation roadmap, there are other organizations that are doing a lot of work trying to uh, help industry to get to know the startup company. So some sort of coordinated activities around around that, uh, I think would be would certainly be forthcoming and would certainly be very helpful. Cool, thank you. Uh, and then Peter, I mean, tech, uh, as I know from my experience back when I was with a, uh, a junior com company introducing technologies, tech are frequently open to new technologies more than a lot of other mining companies, and I'll give you credit for that. Uh, but how does tech approach uh, bringing in new technologies and how do you, what, what's the, the way to bet on a new technology versus an existing technology? Yeah, it's a, it's a loaded question, isn't it? So we do have an innovative culture and it's been around for a long time, but I think it's fair to say that it, it's rapidly evolving as well. Um, we only introduced our technology and innovation group back in 2018. And, and I, I think it's fair to say that we've been moving fairly rapidly around our Race 21 program and digitalization in general. Um, and so we have been working with a lot of startups. We, we connect to them through crowdsourcing uh, means, through uh, academia and, and other contacts, uh, and through things like the BC Digital Supercluster. So, you know, we, we make these connections uh, directly to the question. Typically, we will pilot the technologies, but we can try to do that in an accelerated fashion. Uh, you know, an example would be the, the mindset sense uh, or sorting technology. We, we, we tested that first at, uh, at Highland Valley Copper in BC, uh, and we've rolled that out at, at another site as well. So, um, you know, that's an example where we try to get it in, prove the value, prove that it's it's sustaining or cash flowing, and then move it out to the other, other operations. Uh, we, we're doing the same thing with autonomous haulage at the moment as well. So, um, yeah. Lots of contact points for for uh, startups. Um, we're also very interested in, in uh, exploring opportunities for for uh, an energy center of excellence. Uh, and so, you know, that's a possibility to to create that sort of mini cluster through core as well, and 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 really develop a, a center of expertise around that as well. That would be excellent. Uh, so, Michelle, you're somewhat in the middle there where you're in a big company um, that I'm quite sure is regularly approached by smaller companies that want to uh, introduce new technologies to you uh, and at the same time you're trying to introduce new technologies to your clients and so uh, what would your uh, spin on that be what's the best way of introducing new technologies to industry uh, and, and and I think it's quite a relevant question as we speak you know, uh, we are big companies, free, right? But we also recognize over the last few years that we cannot own 100% of the technology that the market is looking after. Then to collaborate with partners is more and more critical and more and more important for us to be able to deliver value to our customers. Then, uh, I mean, by my position, I'm, I'm certainly the most qualified person in, in, in North America for mining. Uh, to listen to any good idea from startups or you know, innovation company. Um, I mean, and, and what, is, what is very important, uh, I mean, is, is to, pilot, to pilot the idea and to combine the idea with other things to deliver value to our customers. I mean, it's critical. It's critical in, in today's in today situation. As I said, we, we, we recognize that we cannot cover everything, uh, even if we are big. And we need we need to leverage that collaboration across uh, across functions, across technology, but also um, I would say uh, sharing that with with mining companies like tech. And I think as as Peter explained it during the during his last uh, during the last explanation, I mean the race twenty one from tech is also a, a very good um, ecosystem on that on that topic. 
Excellent. Well, I'd like to uh, thank you all. We're, we're getting close to the end here and Catriona has jumped on me in the past and told me that I'm not supposed to take up all the time. She's got a couple of things that she wants to say to wrap up. So I'm going to resist that. I do have other questions that I want to ask. I'm going to hold my tongue uh, and uh, give a personal thank you to, uh, to all three of you um, for your time and uh, your information. It's very, very much appreciated. Uh, and uh, I hope we can continue this conversation as part of the core cluster. Um, and to that end, I will uh, pass over to Catriona for, for her to wrap up. Great. Thank you so much, David. And thank you so much to each of our panelists. What a great discussion today. And key takeaways for me were partnerships are key if we want to accelerate action. Roadmaps with strong timelines um, and to make it aggressive as well. Government support is inherent as well as working with academia, working with SMEs, working with investors, finding that capital to deploy projects on sites. And also linking up with global groups. There's a lot of activity going on that we can learn from. And that's integral to you know, how can we build our center of excellence here in BC as part of the core clean tech cluster. And it's also great to hear that industry is open to innovation. That's really exciting, especially as we're looking to you know, be competitive, you know, new products deliver value, and that value now includes you know, reduction of GHG emissions as well, not just cost. So really exciting discussion, and I wanna say thank you again to everybody for participating. As for next steps, for those of you who are interested in the call, um, you may want to look at our new Core Clean Tech Cluster strategy on the Core Clean Tech website. We also have the publication Mining Gaps and Opportunities for 2050 on the website as well, if you go to the news section. Next week, we're going to be hosting our uh, agriculture and food webinar. Uh, same time, same place. I promise the technology will be better. <laughs> um, and if, to stay involved and if you're, lo you're looking to connect with other folks in the industry, sign up for updates and get in contact with me and my team. I'm more than happy to, you know, engage and discuss on all these interesting issues.